God he will touch you to minister unto needs this evening. First, let me give you a, a good praise report. We have prayed for uh, Brother Lonnie Hopp. He had procedures done today, done some testing today, and uh, thank the Lord all the tests was good. He came back clear. Amen. So thank the Lord, thank the Lord. We just know God heard, and we know God answered prayer. Amen, amen. So also, we know that there are others we'll need to be standing the gap for and praying that the Lord will touch you to minister. Uh, I, I uh, have a couple that uh, has been new that has uh, been brought to our attention, and that is uh, we need to be praying that God's going to touch you to minister uh, in the gala. Gala is, uh, you know, that uh, related to Brother Bill Austin there, and uh, and she is back home. She went to the hospital on the 15th. She'd really been having some issues, but she did come home yesterday. I believe that it was. But uh, we want to keep uh, keep Gala in your prayers, that God will touch and to uh, minister to her because she is really, uh, really having her battles. Um, but we know God's a healer, and we'll pray and believe God to touch and to minister and touch into uh, into Gala as well. Also, we continue to pray. And Sister Linda Rogers, Sister Linda went home uh, Monday night. Monday night. So uh, keep uh, keep Linda in your prayers. She's uh, going to be undergoing still some uh, some things in her home care for uh, several several days. So uh, do keep uh, keep her in our prayers. That God's going to give her complete healing. Him that he does feel good, he feels like the doctor thinks through the through the three surgeries that have taken place, that he's gotten all the infection out. So just to give you a little bit of update there, so keep her in your prayers that everything's going to go well, and we will believe God that it is going to go well for Sister Linda Rogers. So also there were those we have uh, been brought to our attention that they have, uh, have gotten uh, covid they have uh, received and gotten the virus. So, uh, Brother Keith Moore, uh, he checked positive for for the virus. So, we want to pray for Brother Keith that uh, God's going to touch and to uh, minister unto him. And uh, likewise, Sister Mary Hitchcock, she tested positive for the virus, and we know that she's dealing in that and among that uh, in the medical stuff all the time. So, we want to pray for Sister Mary Hitchcock as well that God would touch and to uh, minister unto her so uh, wanted to mention these to you in particular and uh, likewise uh, we need to pray for sister Linda Stanford sister Artie that uh, God would touch into minister unto her she uh, went back to the doctor and uh, they found they found cancer in three different areas uh, of her bottom of her body body both legs and uh, and another area, too, that uh, they'd see on her arm. Okay, so uh, let's pray for Artie Pruitt, that God's going to touch. We prayed for her before, and she got a good report, and uh, we just believe in God, church. All things are possible to him that believes. Amen. So let's pray for Artie. Lift her up unto the Lord again, that God's going to touch and to uh, minister unto her. Likewise, we, we want to continually pray that the Lord's going to minister unto uh, uh, Sister Shirley Obar continually minister for the healing of her ribs. Uh, likewise, we know that uh, we've been been praying that God's going to bring healing to Sister Stella Medlock. Touch Sister Stella for the healing for the broke vertebrae that was there in her neck. She is. Uh, she said she was feeling better the other day than she had felt in a while, so that's good. But uh, we definitely need to keep Sister Stella in our prayers that God's going to touch into. Uh, to bring healing to her. So I uh, wanted to mention her, especially to keep her in your prayers. Um, Pam Moore, keep her in your prayers, battling with uh, with cancer. Need to believe God to touch you to minister unto her. Praying that Sister Shirley McFadden is doing as good as well, keeping her in our prayers. Um, continue praying that the Lord's going to minister. Uh, I think I min mentioned to you that uh, uh, Sister Frances McCormick, she showed uh, negative, clear from the virus. So, uh, Thank the Lord for that. So, uh, but uh, let's keep praying because Brother Keith, uh, yeah, he may have contracted it from his wife. I don't know. Sometimes husbands and wives are real kind with one another, sharing everything they've got. So uh, maybe they've done that. Amen. No, we'll keep praying, believing the Lord to touch and to uh, minister there for them. 
And uh, likewise, we want to continue praying that the Lord's going to uh, touch Brother Bill Alston, his, uh, his niece there in California, for her having several broken bones. Praying for her to touch the ministry. Good to see Sister Courtney here. We know she took a fall, but she, she's got a third leg assisting her, but that, use that leg as long as you need to, all right? Amen. Glad she's better just able to be here as well. Amen. So uh, thank the Lord for that. Amen. So anyway, wanted to uh, share these in particular with you, and uh, you may have some others you'd like to share. I know there are several others that are on our prayer list that we're, we're keeping in our prayers, uh, praying for them on a regular basis. Uh, but you might have some that you might need to mention so that we'll be aware of. And, pray. and Danielle has got her hand up. I don't know what she's going to ask, but I want you to know she lost that big, heavy, heavy boot. So thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Sister Danielle. Who? Thank you. Yes. They mentioned that just in the door. Most of the time, if I don't get something wrote down, it just flies off like a bird. But in any way, thank you, Sister Danielle. So we got to pray for, uh, for John and, uh, and for Jennifer House. It was uh, one of their kids, wasn't it? Maddie. Maddie. That I pray for Maddie that she, uh, she showed positive for it. So bless her hearts. Uh, so we're praying. Man, this thing has sure been running rampant. I was, just, I was just bragging and carrying on. I guess maybe God just checked me. But I, I know in, uh, in 20, when this thing really broke out, uh, you know, we were really blessed. We only had about three families that ended up with this. Now, I know one sitting back there named Tammy Baker, and I know she was on the ventilator a couple different times. She went, really went through the ordeal with this thing. But uh, we know Brother Earl and them had it. Anyway, there was about three different families that had it through that process, but the church was blessed, we as a whole. So uh, thank the Lord for it. But God can do it again. There are several that are doing it now. I'm speaking, I'm taking a little long time, forgive me. But I'm saying that from the standpoint, um, thank the Lord that this go-around, um, it does not seem to be quite as critical as it was whenever Sister Tammy and them back in the 20s and the first part of 21 had contracted this virus. Um, so uh, let's pray that God's going to touch and minister in each of these um, for his blood covering and protection um, up over here in the church uh, for the church of the Lord Jesus, who we know God's going to honor and answer prayer. If you have requests, and I'm going to quit and let you share. If you have requests you'd like to share with anyone, yeah, Sister Debbie. Thank you. See there? I think I got that wrote down, Sister Tammy. <laughs> Sister Tammy is going to be having, she's going to the uh, doctors tomorrow. They're going to be doing some evaluations. Um, let's pray she's going to get a good report, um, a positive uh, report. Um, that God's going to take care of her situation. So we'll believe the Lord. Thank you, Sister Debbie, for reminding me. I was going to do that, Sister Tammy, and I just flew off like a bird. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, Sister Juan. Okay. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Luan. Appreciate that. Yeah. Wow. God's good, isn't he? Amen. God's so, so, so very good. Praise the Lord. Good, good, good. Anyone else? Yeah, Sister Linda? Yes. Okay, pray for Bonnie. Go ahead, Sister Monica. Okay. You bet. Yeah, amen. Yes. So let's believe the Lord for Bonnie then, that God's going to touch her for the ongoing battle she's been dealing with. But tomorrow it sounds like they can take care of it. So let's pray they will. Amen. That the Lord take care of it. Amen. All right, anyone else? Okay. Amen, and uh, thank you for reminding me about that, Brother Donald, because uh, we're here 
The little old town of insignificant Mulberry has hit national news. What can you say? And uh, <clears throat> the enemy can take anything and run rampant with it. And as we are aware of, church, none of us are exempt uh, from the things that can take place uh, in this world. Uh, and though we may seem like we're a small community, we're still not exempt as we see what has transpired uh, through the news. So thank you, Brother Donald. Just elaborate a little more. Very important. Uh, let's do pray with sincerity. Good, good, good. Others? Anyone else? All right. Amen. Special and spoken requests then and lost loved ones. Leaving God to touch and minister. You notice probably on the news, brother, there's about 15 killed where that uh, the, the, the devil has struck again there in Ukraine. Russia had hit them again. So in just different areas. So do remember remember these. And uh, and again, I won't emphasize, church, uh, I, I, I do this cautiously, but I do it confidently. We do not know what's going to be ahead of us on the tomorrows. Uh, but as things are moving, church, uh, we are looking at some things that could definitely take place here in America that's not positive, and we are not exempt. We've got to stay ready. Stay ready to meet the Lord no matter what. Does that sound okay? All right. Praise the Lord. So just wanted to mention that. Remember our missionaries at home and abroad, God to touch and undertake for each of them. So let's pray for all these needs. Let's believe God is going to touch. Sister Evans is going to lead us in a course. Prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer. tonight, Lord, all oh, the confirmation of what your word is that we've just sung, Lord. Let the power of your spirit, Lord, be the evidence that is needed. Remove viruses, Lord. Cleanse and oh, and hearts and lives, Lord. Remove this COVID thing, Lord. Remove cancers, God. Give us healing, oh God. Cancer's a name, but your name's above the name cancer. Your name's above the name virus, God. 
we yield to you, Lord. We pray tonight, Lord, for those that are going to be having tests, God. And Lord, we're going to the doctor. We pray, Lord, for the intercession of your spirit, Lord, to move upon and give us a good report. Lord, we thank you tonight. Thank you for the good report we've heard tonight, Lord, from Sister Luan's report that she gave us in the Bogolani, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, for the others, that, Lord, that they showed that they were proved negative and not positive for this fire. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray, let your Holy Spirit do your perfected work in each heart and in each life, because we know you're the Almighty. Let the power of your Spirit to demonstrate your might minister, Lord, as only, only you can in each heart and each soul, Lord. You are God, you are God, you are God. Give us souls, Lord, moms and dads, sons and daughters, God. Let the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, touch you to minister and move up over each one. Oh, for salvation. Lord, in the day and hour, we need you more than ever before. Lord, we don't know what's on tomorrow, but we know you hold it no matter what, Lord. And we cast all our care upon you because we know you're the one that cares for us, Lord. We love you. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Reach out with that hand that is not waxing short. Be concerned of promises in your holy name. In your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Tammy Baker right now. Lord, we pray for Sister Tammy, Lord. She's going to the doctor tomorrow. Lord, we just pray that there's going to be a good report. We're going to receive, Father, a good confirmation that things are well. And you're going to take care of her, Lord. No matter what, you're going to take care of her, Lord, to give her healing, to intercede, Lord, with the difficulties she's been having. And we agree together, Lord. And we know your word says, According to Matthew 18 and 19, if any two or three shall agree on earth and touch any one thing, heaven, it'll be given of you, Lord. And we commit unto you, Lord, Sister Tammy, for a good report coming forth tomorrow in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, musicians. Thank you so very much, Sister Evans. Thank you guys so very much for leading us in some some worship and some singing this evening and for what the Lord has done and what the Lord is doing. And amen, amen, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, amen. Well, we're honored this evening, Brother uh, Brother John Goodman and Courtney and Jonathan and his family. They've been coming now and uh, for quite a while. And uh, Brother uh, Brother John, he is a uh, he is a preacher, minister of the gospel. I know he has not preached here before, but uh, we want to give him that opportunity that he can bread of life before us here. And so we're going to give him that opportunity to preach and to minister to us this evening. And uh, we're glad that your family is with us tonight, Brother John. God bless you. Amen. Welcome. God bless you. Amen. So at this time, I don't know what he wants to do. I told him to make himself comfortable. We've got two pulpits. Amen. He can do it right here or else he can do it with the one right there. It does not matter. He can go from there to here, from here to there. It doesn't matter. Amen. But we just want you to know, Brother John, you're at home, brother. We want you to take your liberty in the Lord, and we want you just to preach to us as the Lord leads you. And we're receptive and receiving what God's got for us from you. So come, 
God bless you. We love you. Appreciate you, Brother John. Brother John Goodman. Amen. Well, hello. Oh, that's hot. Um, I'd like to take just a moment, if that's okay, and kind of give a lot of you who may not know me a little backstory about me. I have to forgive the emotion part of it because it's been a long time since I've stood before the children of God. I was called to preach at 18, and, and I did that for a while. And Sister Zelda and Brother Jerry may remember me preaching at the Ozark Church, uh, in the PCG Church when they went there. I preached there quite a bit. Um, so at 18, I was called to preach, and, and I thought that was the most awesome thing I was ever called to do. Uh, but also the scariest thing I'd ever done. Because you're standing in front of people, breaking bread, as Pastor said. You're, you're, you're supposed to rightly divide the word of God. And, that, so, and I did that for a few years. And I'm going to give you the abridged version because it's, you know, I'm 43. It was 18. It's 25. It's a long time. <laughs> so I went to college and, and went to Bible college in Joplin, Missouri. And had my heart set on getting my pastorship and, and going there. Some things took me away from that for a while. And I came home and did my own thing. I ran from God as fast and as far as I could go. Uh, while I was up in, in Joplin, I went in, ended up going to an Assembly of God church. <clears throat> became the youth pastor and associate pastor while I was there. Um, but I don't know if it was me not being ready. Me not wanting it bad enough or whatever the case may be that pulled me away. But the Bible says we're pulled away when we're tempted by our own desires. So at some point, my desires didn't line up with God's desire. And that created this problem that we have, this carnal issue, this battle that we always have in our life. So fast forward to now, and a lot of things have happened. I won't bore you with the details, but I learned a lot. I grew a lot. I became the man that I was supposed to be. And it wasn't until probably six months ago that I became the man my family needed me to be. The man that God called me to be. There's a lot of echo in, in, in these. <laughs> it's okay. And so what I wanted, and you know, Pastor, I went to him and said, listen, I, I was called to preach and I want to preach. But more importantly, I just want to serve. My wife and I, we just want to serve. Wherever God sees fit, cleaning the toilets, wiping the floors, whatever, I don't care. Because something has snapped in me. My priorities have flipped. And I was talking to the pastor I worked under before today. I was talking to him, and he said, John, I think the revival's coming. And I said, let me tell you something. It's funny you say that, because last Sunday, my pastor said, we're going to have a revival. And there's this calling home that's beginning to happen. But guys, let me tell you something. He can call us. The Bible says he can call us, and he will call us. We have to go. We have to answer that call. It's no point in us sitting here and him calling because let me tell you one thing. He'll only call for so long. And then that still small voice will kind of diminish. Not because he's left, because he never changes, but because we, we, myself, have walked so far from where I thought God could reach me. I said I thought he could reach me. I ran away, Pastor Kendrick. I ran because I didn't want to put my hand to that plow. My 13, my 11 year old, he, he knows what happens. What happens, Jonathan, when you put your hand to plow and you take it off? Right. That's what the Bible says. Right. So so I spent a lot of time seeking forgiveness, not because I was out in the world sinning, but because I had turned my back on God. I wasn't. I was sinning. Let's just be honest. Right. But then I came to not doing the sinning thing, but still not living like he had called me to live. So that's where I am today. And he says, hey, you can, can you get something together for us on Wednesday. And he kind of leaned in. He goes, you probably already have something, don't you? And I was like, I have about eight somethings. So I'm not doing them all tonight. So that's OK. You know. But anyway, what I do want to talk about, I want to read two verses real quick. And then I'm going to talk a lot. There's a lot of reading. I don't expect you all to stand for a lot of the reading. But I would like you to stand for Mark 10, 47 and 48. And it said, and when he heard 
There, hold on, let me get my eyeballs on them. They pretend I didn't need these glasses. No, at 43, I need them. And he heard, and when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. And he did. That's not what the Bible says, folks. The Bible says, but he cried more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you tonight for allowing me, of all people, to come before this wonderful group of people and split the word of God to the marrow if I can, God. God, let these words come forth from me as you would deliver them to me, God. And let something that is said tonight bless someone's soul. Lord, more importantly, let it quicken them. Let the word of God quicken them to call them to repentance. God, I ask all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. How many here know of a gentleman by the name of Michael Phelps? Know him? How about Dwayne the Rock Johnson? Yeah. Thomas Edison? Yeah. Stephen King? Okay. All right. What do these five people have in common? Well, they, they probably have money, yeah. Michael, huh? They're go getters. Michael Phelps went five years without missing a single day in the water. Now, people would call him crazy. Man, Michael, you're crazy. Why do you want to do that? Why do you got to do it in the water? You're not a fish. He goes on to be an Olympian swimmer. Dwayne The Rock Johnson works out six days a week for four hours a day. And he goes on to, I'm sure you've seen one of his movies. Thomas Edison. A thousand times he failed before creating the light. And Stephen King, his first novel was rejected 30 times before he goes on to sell 350 million copies of his books. These men have in common, they could have quit at any time. They could have gave up and said, I'm done. I've been rejected. The world don't want me. I'll never make it in the pool. But they did not give up. So I ask you tonight, how bad do you want it? Jacob, in Genesis 29, 18, 30, I'm going to read pieces of it here. And Jacob loved Rachel. He said, I will serve thee for seven years. He's talking to Laban, who was his uncle, I believe, a kinfolk of some sort. And he says, yeah, okay. So he said, I'll serve you for seven years for your Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee then that should give her to another man. Abide with me, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. It goes on to say here, in 21, it says, Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled. Now, I noticed something in here in preparing this. And I'll see if y'all catch it. He said, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And it said, Laban gathered together the men of the place and made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening, and he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went into her. Long story short, we all know how this turns out, right? Wasn't really what he wanted, but he didn't specify. He said, give me my wife. He didn't say, give me Rachel. Right? So Laban took it upon himself to say, here, I'm just going to fix this right now. It wasn't in their country a, 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 a custom to give away the younger before the older. So they had to go rectify that. Long story short, the dude had to work seven more years. I love my wife. But if you tell me I got to work 14 years for her, I'm going somewhere else. I'm just playing. <laughs> he worked 14 years for his wife because he wanted her bad enough. It wasn't enough to have Leah. He didn't want just some other woman. He wanted Rachel. And he did whatever it took to get her. No matter what, he could have at any point said, this isn't the deal we had. This isn't what I wanted. But he persevered and he persevered and he went through the mark. The Bible doesn't specify whether he said, I'll get back to you in a week. Right. The Bible said in 28, and Jacob did it so. He was resolute in his decision. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to consult the high council. 
He didn't have to ask anyone else. He knew what he wanted. He did it no matter what. So let me ask you, how many times in our lives have we turned away from what we thought we wanted and left it on the table? Did we want it bad enough to begin with? The Bible says he gives us the desires of our hearts. He gives us the desires of our hearts. All we have to do is take it. It wasn't until probably a year ago I knew what that desire was. I knew I grew up and I always wanted uh, a penthouse on the 40th story of New York City. I wanted it all. You know, I wanted fame. I wanted, I wasn't afraid to work for it, but I wanted it. I wanted that lifestyle. I got married to my wife. I still wanted that lifestyle. You can't serve two masters. You know, so a decision had to be made. In Mark, oh, sorry, I skipped over my note here. Jacob working for his wife. Now, all four of these pattern a lot after what we face every single day in our lives. We, as men, we walk around, we dress up nice, we put our best smelly goods on, and we go out and we find us a lady, right? That's what Jacob was. So that that simplifies the men completing themselves because the Bible says we leave and cleave, right? That's the story of completion. We're looking for that completion. On the second story, we're chasing after material possessions and status because our worldly viewpoint, the thing that's pushed down our throats every single day, you have to wear this suit to be worth anything. You have to go to this school to be worth anything. You have to have this kind of car to be worth anything. You have to live in this kind of neighborhood to have anything, to be any kind of status. But that is junk. It's all vain. It's all vanity, the Bible says. Vanity, vanity. It's all vanity. It is our chasing after material possessions. And that happens in Mark 17. Well, excuse me, Mark 10. 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may have, that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, he said, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't lie to your parents. And the man said, I've done all of these, master. He said, well. There's one thing you lack. Go thy way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up thy cross and follow me. This man was so sad. He went away grieved because he had great possessions. Now, it didn't say here that he did or didn't do those things, but the context tells us he probably didn't do those things. And what can we read? What can we get out of that? He didn't want it bad enough. He See, he had went through those good schools, probably. He wore the nice clothes, drove the nice carriage or the chariot. He had all those things, but it didn't give him eternal life. See, he was worldly, but knew where eternal life was at. Because he went to the Master. He went to the Savior and said, what can I do to get eternal life. And he says, you've done all these things? Cool, good for you, but do this one thing more. Church, let me tell you something. If we're not careful, we get so attached to these things that are vanity. We work so hard for the status. We work so hard. I mean, I did it. I was taught my whole life, you work hard to school, you go to college. I did. My student loans don't like me for that, but I went. I got my degrees. I came out, I had the nice home, I had the nice car, I had all that, but I was so, so empty inside. Because none of those things feel what I had to have. And so I found myself just like this guy. I wasn't rich and I'm not young anymore, but falling down to the knees of the Savior. And he says, you have to do all these. But church, let me tell you, it's not that hard. We wake up every day. We put our life in his hands. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I when that means you no longer in charge of your life, here's what it means to me. Every decision I have to make, every path I have to lead my family on, every 
gap that I stand into before, because of my family, no matter what protection or hedge I pray around them, it comes from the Word of God. It does not come from Fox News. It does not come from anything on Facebook. It does not come by anything else but God Almighty. He is the way. He is the truth and He is the light. I walk down the other path. It's not any fun. But I promise you one thing. In the short time that I've not me, in the short time that God has allowed me mercy to come before the throne of God and seek His forgiveness and turn my life around and pick back up the mantle that was down, I promise you, I have never felt more alive in my entire life because something's different this time. Something's real this time. Because I declared in my home on a Wednesday night, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because he says that, he also tells them, if you're not willing to do that, get out. He told them to leave because it was his house. And he stood there and declared before God Almighty, I'm yours. And he meant it. Church, let me tell you something. If you haven't done that, It's going to be a rocky road. You'll have no foundation. You'll have nothing to cling to when the storms of life are just flooding and beating you over the side every single day. I'm not saying it's going to be a walk in the park, but it will sure be a lot easier with the Lord Jesus Christ on your side. He says, what shall I do to inherit life? Now, this is in Matthew. Well, excuse me, this is in Mark. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And this is a little bit of foreshadowing here. Because to inherit signifies you're an heir of something. Yeah? Right? When, you're, when your parents leave this world, they usually leave a will and they leave things behind. Right? So in Mark, he says, I want to inherit eternal life. Romans 8, 17 says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So he knew before the, set, before the crucifixion, he knew that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And he wanted eternal life. Just like the man on the cross looked at him and said, remember me when you enter into paradise. Our journey, men and women, to become the teacher of life lesson. We have kids. Wow. <laughs> That's a hard one. Right? But we desire them. We love them. They bring joy in our life. Our desire to want to teach them the right way, the right things, how to live right, how to serve a God. What it looks like to have God in your home. What it looks like to have a mother and a father who pray for you every single day. What it looks like because our parents, they wanted it bad enough. They did whatever it took. They sacrificed. They gave up their knots. God, my mom can tell you stories after stories after stories of her in church anointing napkins and handkerchiefs to put under my pillow because her heathenistic child wouldn't sit still in church. Because he would go to the bars and he would do all kinds of junk that wasn't godly. But she didn't quit. She hung in there because she knew she served a God who never failed. And she said, he will get my son. It might not happen next week. It might not happen tomorrow. But I'm putting him in God's hands. In 2 Kings, we have two gentlemen. And it came to pass when the Lord would take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. That Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, Elijah turned to Elisha and said, listen, you need to stay here. I'm going to do a lot of walking. From Gilgal to Bethel, if I've done it, researched it properly, it's about an hour and a half drive. They didn't have cars back then. So, it's about a 20-hour walk, if I'm not mistaken. He goes to Gil from Gilgal to Bethel. Elijah turns to Elijah and says, now listen, you need to stay here. This is going to be a long walk, okay? Elijah says, no, as my soul lives, as the Lord lives, I'm going with you. Two other times this happened. 
And Elijah said to, hold on, let me find it real quick. <laughs> Elijah said to him, Terry, I pray here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. So he goes to Jordan. And it, in verse 8 says, Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that two of them went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over, Elijah looked to Elisha and said, Hey, what can I do for you before I'm taken away? He said, I want a double portion. He says, what you ask is very, very hard, but I'm going to tell you what. You see me go, it's going to happen. You see me stop, sorry, it's going in the cards for you. The point of the story is, if my son Bradley or Caleb or Jonathan said, hey, I need to go to the store and you have to walk me there and it's going to be 20 hours. <laughs> what do you have? What can we fix it around here? We don't need tape. We got. We need some milk. We'll go milk a cow. I ain't walking 20 hours. I don't want it bad enough. Elisha did. Are you starting to kind of see this pattern here? These people, these men of God, these people in the Bible wanted a relationship so bad. You couldn't have stopped them no matter what you'd done. They pressed through. They did it. Blind Bartimaeus, the passage we word. This guy was carried to the gates. A little tip of information. A long time ago, back around 1996, uh, we went to Victory Temple, and we did a song. We did a drama, a musical drama about Blind Bartimaeus. It was by the Steels. It says, go and tell somebody. We came here to do that. Y'all might not remember, but y'all might remember. But it was me and my wife, my mom, and our whole youth group came here and did that drama. We won nationals that year, and we went to California at the talent show, and we performed there in front of everybody. And it was awesome. But we did it on this story. It says, be quiet. He don't want to hear you. He can't hear you. You're just begging for no reason. And the more they egged him on to be quiet, the more he stood up or in himself stood up and said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to press on because I want it bad enough. I'm here every single day in the dust, in the rain. People are walking around me, spitting on me, throwing things down around me. But I'm going to stay here. And they kept saying, shut up. He's, he's not going to listen to you. Be quiet. Be quiet. He don't have time for you. He says, I want it more than I want to listen to you. And the Bible says he cried and cried until he said, OK, bring him to me. And he says, what will you have me do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I want my sight. Did he give him his sight? The Bible says he made him whole. That's not just sight. Guys, get that. Grab that. Live on that. Because what we ask for from God, we may see one need right here. We might not see the 50 more lined up. Right? We ask for God. We come before his throne. We come boldly before his throne. If and only if you want it bad enough. If you don't want it bad, then don't. But if you want it bad enough, you don't know what you're about to get from God. Because he might just not give you the sight. He might give you everything. He might take away the gimp leg. He might take away your mortgage payment. He might take it all away. Because he's Jesus Christ. He don't need, he don't need authority. He is the authority, guys. He is the authority. There are people in this world today, you know, school started back, and it was my wife and I were talking about sending them back to school. Like, I don't want to. The school's terrible. If you're a teacher, I'm sorry. Not y'all. It's just the whole thing, right? I don't want to send them back into that mess that they've taken God out of. They, they did that. It wasn't like it was done for them. They decided. I mean, they, the world, took God away from our kids for eight hours a day. You know, at homeschool, we get to do what we want to. We want to teach them straight from the Bible. We can do that. How bad do we want it? I didn't want to send him to school, but I know he needs social interaction and blah, blah, blah. And he's doing fantastic. Because we pray, we want it so much for him. We pray for all of our kids every single day, day in, day out, every night. God, keep your mercy and protection over them. And honestly... I'm so afraid that if we don't pray that much, we just don't know. But there will be people in this world who tell you God's dead. He's not going to hear you. 
He's not listening to you. He has to watch the entire world. If, in fact, they believe in God at all. It is up to us to stand and make a decision. Do you want it bad enough? Do you want it bad enough? There's healing. There's forgiveness. Salvation. There's getting closer with God. There's revival. I'm going to tell you right now. He mentioned revival. I'm all over that. I'm praying for it, Pastor. And if you're not praying for it, I challenge you every single day, 10, 15 minutes, pray for it. Because two things. Number one, it's coming whether you want it to or not. You understand me? So you can either get on that bandwagon and welcome it or go hide somewhere because he's coming back. And the Bible says the revival is coming before that. We don't know if it's this revival right here starting whenever he says or the one three years down the road. But what does it matter? You better want it and you better be praying for it because it's coming. You want our church to grow? How bad do you want it? Oh, uh oh. You better pray a little bit. You want the pastor to bring forth a fiery message every single Sunday? How bad do you want it? You want the Holy Ghost dripping from these walls like I feel him every single Sunday? How bad do you want it? The Bible says only some things come from prayer and fasting. How bad do you want it? Am I getting through? It takes a little effort on our part. The man who was carried by the well and says when the troubles or when the waters are troubled, healing comes. He couldn't get there fast enough. But you know what? Jesus seen that and said, I got you, man, because you're here faithful. How bad do you want it? There's one more lesson. There was a man by the name of Abraham. That he would be the father of nations. And he said, I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham said, that's crazy. Even his wife said, that's crazy. I'm 90-something years old. It's not going to happen. And he got that son. And then God said, hey, Abraham, I want you to give me that son. And he called him to an altar. And he said, bring your only child to me. He's mine. Abraham didn't miss a beat, ladies and gentlemen. He carried that son up that hill, and he laid him on the altar. Why did he do that? Because he wanted it bad enough. And God said, I got you. Because you obeyed me, because you showed me you want it, I got you. I got your sacrifice right here. And he left with, with Isaac in his arms and in his hands. I was going to go down the hill. Sacrifice is better. I'm sorry, obedience is better. Got it mixed up there point is how bad do you want it we can talk lip service all day but there is a god in heaven who is there sitting on the throne and we can talk through our lips all day long but the bible says he knows our very hearts we cannot lie to him we cannot hide from him we can't shield anything from his eyes so we want to say i want it i want it you better make sure you want it and you better bring him the best you have you better at least give him 15, 20 minutes a day to pray and thank him for everything that we've gotten. Because it, without him, we wouldn't be here. All of these praise reports in this church, I'm going to tell you something right now. When we came here, I was scared to death. New, I'm very critical. If you don't know me at all, know me, I'm very critical. And when this man stood up here that Sunday and said, this is a Pentecostal church. I looked at my wife and I said, we're home. I don't have to breathe through the, the fog mirrors and the lights and the color shows and the thump, thump, thump from the speakers. Not that that's bad to each their own. I'm getting too old for that mess, right? He says, we're a Pentecostal church and this is the kind of church we're going to be. And I'm going to preach the word, he said. And I said, this is where we need to be. So God moves us. This is where we are. It's a drive. How bad do you want it? There's people driving from all over this county. Y'all must want it pretty bad. How bad do y'all want it? He is our shepherd. 
He's going to bring revival to this church. How bad do you want it? He brought salvation to you on a cross. His blood flowed from this cross down to where you sit right now. You can't hide nothing. You can't shield nothing. He's already seen it. You have nothing to hide. You have nothing to hold back on. How bad do you want it? Now, I'm not talking about a religion. Come to church all you want to. You fill a few big deal. You better have a relationship. How bad do you want it? Because at the end of the day, when you stand before God Almighty, he don't care how many times you were here. He don't care how many suit jackets or whatever you wore. He don't care about any of that. He's going to open up a book. And he's going to say, is your name here? And you're going to say, I hope so. He'll say, how bad did you want it? And you're either in or you're out. There is no gray. There's no holding cell. There's no wait here till there's room. Wait for the next train to come by. It's either in or it's out. That's it, folks. It's time. The revival could be. This could be the revival. I, I, I cannot tell you. As skeptical, as skeptical as a man stands before you tonight. Who wants to look at everything and go, I can explain that. I have a master's degree. I can explain that away. It's science. I'm going to tell you something right now. Y'all don't know me. This man of God took a huge leap of faith to allow someone that he doesn't know personally to stand up here to y'all. But I'm going to tell you right now, this church, God's here in this church. He's here in this church. Y'all ain't hearing me. He's here in this church. This is the only church we came to visit. And it wasn't because, not that y'all are not good looking. Y'all are all great looking. But there was closer ones. I'm going to tell you what. Something drew us here. And this is where the Spirit of God is. But I ask you, I urge you. There was a, there was a time that a bunch of people wanted something so bad. And I, I'm going to close, I promise. When it's so bad, they got together one day and they prayed. And it wasn't just a, oh, Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's go home. Let's go to Golden Corral. They just watched the man they called friend, brother, teacher, and ultimately Savior die on a cross. And about 50 days later, they were in this room. And you know what they wanted? They wanted it bad enough. I'm going to tell you right now, they wanted it so bad. And the Bible says a sound came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And it lit that place up. And they preached and they sang and they praised God. And 3,000 people came to the church that day because they wanted it bad enough. They had no clocks looking at. They had nothing but serving God and their desire to please him and serve him. And he showed up. And the world ain't been the same since. And it's not going to be the same. I hate to say it, but the world is going to go downhill very quickly. You want saving and forgiveness? You want, your, you want your unsaved loved ones here next to you? How bad do you want that? Because one might argue, you don't want it bad enough if you don't willing to do what it takes. Last story, I promise. I talked to my mom was a nurse for 30 years, long time. I don't know. I got to know the doctors really well. I wanted to be a surgeon. Yeah. We knew some surgeons, and I said, hey, can I come watch you do a surgery? So I scrubbed in, stood back, and watched it all. And I was like, well, didn't pass out, so that's a good sign. And I got to talking to mom. Okay, let's get serious about this. What, what do I got to do? Well, you got to go to college. Yeah, okay, cool. For 13 years, I'm out. I didn't want it bad enough. Guys, it's a simple question. You married your wife because you wanted her bad enough. How much do we want God, really? I tell you what, if the people out there pray like the people in here, we'd be in revival right now. Are we praying the, for the right thing? How bad do we want it? Sometimes we got to give up some stuff, right? He calls us to holiness, righteousness. 
Guys, I appreciate you letting me do this. I'm going to turn it back over to you. But I'm going to tell you right now, just how bad do you want it? Is it enough to wish for it and hope for it? And like, man, I hope, I hope he saves me. I hope, I hope he forgives me. Or do we bang that door down to heaven and say, I'm here. I'm here every day. Guide me, lead me, direct me. Let me be the father and the man and the husband that I'm supposed to be or the wife I'm supposed to be. If we're not doing that, I dare say, myself included, we don't want it bad enough. Because if we did, we'd do what it took and we would see miracles happen. Because he's a God. He's not just any God. He is the God who sits on a throne, who sent his son Jesus to wipe our sins away. Guys, this is, some say this old book, this old book, this other book. No, man, this is the book. This is the book. You want to learn how to live your life? You better read that book. You better get a relationship, not a program, not religion. You find God. You find Jesus, and you hook up with him, and you never leave his side. So, Pastor Kendrick, thank you. I turn this over to you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, I think you've just done a pretty good all right job. <laughs> all right. Good job, Brother John. Appreciate it, my brother. Good word. Amen. Because that is a message that it just needs to be worldwide to where it has to be a sincerity. How bad do we want it? Amen. And unfortunately, as we look around, we can see there's not enough that really want it bad enough. They don't even want to go to church on Sunday, you know. Amen. Hey, let's pray. Let's ask God to touch and minister. We'll have a desire in our heart to serve him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength him, to give him all of ourselves him, and pray for souls, that God will give us souls him. And I believe God's going to give us revival. I know it's still over a month away. We look at it in October, but I still believe God's going to give us a great, great revival. And like Brother John said, in the process, we in revival. And God can minister and move. And I believe he's going to, don't you? Amen. If you would, then if you don't have to, but if you'd like to come around the altars, this is a good place to come. Come around the altars. Let's spend a little time in prayer before we go home tonight. And uh, let's just ask God to touch you to minister into our lives. And let's pray, God, I want it no matter what. Amen. Amen. Come if you would. God bless you as you respond. And let's pray. If you don't want to come to the altars in the front, just make an altar where you are there. And let's spend a little time talking, talking to the Lord. God bless you tonight. Amen.